Hello, my name is Yemi Alade, and you're watching Right Bad TV. This is Thought Leaders on Right Bad TV. This is another episode of Thought Leaders, man. I have enjoyed this season of Thought Leaders. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure you guys at home have learned a lot too. So today, we're sitting with Vista Kalipa, widely and famously known as Vista. How are you doing, Vista? I'm I like great. I like Thanks. that Vista. It's almost got like that Visa Mastercard. <laughs> so let's 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 talk about that a little bit. Um, the business of uh, PR. You in the PR industry, right? Uh, in this season, we've looked at a lot of publicists. We've looked at a lot of strategists, uh, and they've talked a lot around the actual processes, operational processes involved in the industry of PR. But we haven't really looked into the business of it. Um, and I think that's what I need to extract from you, the business of public relations and communication um, from a national point of view. How are we standing? The public relations um, industry in South Africa, the way that it is now, it is actually doing quite well in terms of, now I mean, like in terms of practitioners that are actually, um, you know, working in the industry right now. Uh, they bring there's a lot of great energy that you know that is being that is coming forward, but particularly from the younger generations, obviously because now we live in a um, you know in a digital era, so we're not doing things the way that we used to or that we were taught back in school because you know there have been so many years since then. Yeah. Uh, so the evolution of the industry itself, you know, has adapted to um, to, to the current climate. Um, so you know we're no longer just relying on just sending out a press release and think that you know something, <laughs> somebody will you know will catch it. Mm. You're not only doing that. Um, you know it lives beyond the press releases. Uh, you've got to have digital support to you know to um, that will amplify the content that you're putting out and widen uh, your reach. You've got to widen the reach as well. So you can't now just think that you're only just putting out content focusing on South Africa. Yeah. Somebody else that is you know outside of these borders is going to pick up on it because. The all of that content is now on, the, like you know, on the um, excuse me, on, on the web, on the internet, yeah, and it's true. accessible. A lot of people can actually reach and get to it. You've got to be careful. Whatever it is that you put out now, once it leaves your hands and it's on the net, you can never get it. You can never, you know, uh, retract it. You can never take it back. So you got to make sure. That's why you always have to guard the contents that you're putting out. Sometimes you put, you know, you tweet something because you think you're just being uh, funny. You're joking, you know, with your friends, but. You forget that there wow. are more eyes that are actually looking at that. That is going down as part of your repertoire and CV even. Ex absolutely. Absolutely. And somebody else who maybe, let's say it's a potential client that may have been looking at you, interested in working with you, but now you've put out something that is completely um, crazy on the internet that goes against what that client, what the client stands for and that goes against, that actually, you know, taints your reputation your as reputation well. Your reputation as a person. So then it, that person won't want to touch you. So that is, it's you. not a phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon that brands and corporates are actually looking to social media to get to know the real candidates that they're looking to employ. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, when they say, uh, when clients, let's say they're considering uh, using celebrities or social influencers, um, as we call them, obviously to push whatever um, message that the brand wants to, you know, wants to send out to the public, they look at the profiles of those people that you you know that we would have suggested and put forward okay. um they look at how their uh, you know social media behavior has been um okay. you know recently and or maybe even in the past year because uh you know they look at all of those things what sort of content are they putting out you know when they are not um doing brand related stuff but when they are doing their own personal things so you look at the content that these people are putting out you know, is it representative of what you want to put out as a company so now you're telling me that uh, as a pr leader and strategist in the country, these are things you put forward to brands in board meetings that, listen, why go the traditional route of a Metro FM who has a following of, let's say, 500,000 on mm. Instagram or Twitter, as opposed to going for a Pearl Tusi who has a million followers on Instagram and Twitter, and saying that they could extend the brand's reach further than the actual radio station. Precisely, that is exactly that. Um, so that is part of the, you know, our job. That's what we do. We advise our clients. We sit down with them. We, you know, we, it's, we have, a, you know, a session where we, 
we counsel them and we tell because we are the experts so we are we are giving you the you know the, the knowledge that we have exactly. um we live in this space we know we know it so i it is my job to sit down with you and let you know actually this is the direction we should be going with this and these are the platforms and the channels that we are going to use in order for us to get the message across So we're back on this episode of Thought Leaders with the main man Vista and he's spreading some light on the digital era that we live in. Speaking about the digital area that we're in, there's, there's this thing. Um, I see one of your clients actually was the South African Book Association. So book Council, yeah. Yeah, South African mm -hmm. Book Council. Um, would you say uh, reading the hard copy books is being distorted and taken away by the digital area and e-books? I wouldn't say it's taking it away. I, it, there's this notion, that, you know, that uh, or understanding or perception rather, um, you know, that books are actually going away. Books aren't going away. Yes, you reckon? Like, I mean, but books, from books everything are not. that mm. you've said to me right now, mm. seemingly it's all digital. It's not all digital. See, that's the thing. It's there's now digital support to actually amplify even more in terms of what the actual, um, you know, hard copy is. is is doing. Mm -hmm. So if uh, we were just talking now, actually, um, with the recent National Book Week, um, so some of the conversation, that was some of the questions that people actually posed were that, you know, are books still relevant? Do people still buy books and all of that? Yeah. And there's a difference between, uh, you know, between all of that. Mm. Yes, there is um, a growth in the digital um, age. Um, pe you know, people rather preferring to buy books uh, on I, what do you call it on ebooks and on your this, ipad yeah. yes ebooks on your on your ipad you know but if you think about the long term um, aspect of that is that in the long run because you're staring at the screen for such a very long time so if you're reading a very long book and mm -hmm. all you know you just keep staring at the screen it's going to affect your health it's going to affect your eyes so um, and when you're traveling or you're like you're on a plane and, and that kind of stuff people still actually want to hold hold a physical book mm -hmm. rather than you you know, be paging for an iPad, texture. which may, yes, and that thing you has, know, to, it has to be charged. You know, I've always that smell of new books, eh? There's Absolutely. I also love it, smell, actually. Right? <laughs> I actually love it. Um, you know, so, and, you know, the iPads and everything, they have to be charged and then they die. So there's an inconvenience that comes with them as well. Whereas if you're having a physical copy that you're holding, uh, you know, it's not going to... It's not, it's not going to die on you. Yeah. You are going to continue with that. You're going to read it until you feel that you are tired. Mm. Um, so to come back to whether you know books are dying or not, mm -hmm. no, books are not dying. They will still be around. So that hard copy element is going nowhere according going to your nowhere. forecast and what you think. Yes. Okay, that, that makes sense. Let's mm. talk about the South African Book Council. What does that involve and what does that entail? Do you have annual yeah. events or do you have book reading sessions? Are mm. you uh, covering books, uh, specific books at a specific time? Well, the South African Book Development Council um, was formed you know, to actually encourage more South Africans to read. Um, so there was a study that was conducted in about 2007. Yes, I'm interested to know what the stats <laughs> <Yes>. say. Yes, <clears throat> there's a study that was conducted in about 2007. So that found that actually only 14% of South Africans are actual, um, you know, book are active book readers. Wow. Only 14% of the entire population. Wow. And 5% of... That's a population of, of 55 million? Yes. Wow. And only 14% of us are actually active book readers. And I'm talking, uh, you know, like leisure books and all kind of not the prescribed ones, you yes. know, like textbooks and that kind oh, of stuff. Oh, yes. Yeah. So okay. I'm talking, you know, like leisure books. Um, so, and then 5% of those, are, you know, like read to their children. Only 5%. Jeez. And so, you know, like there, there, was, there was those um, glaring numbers and that more than more than 50, yeah, so about more than 51% of South African households do not have a leisure book at home. Wow. So every time they see a book, it's either a religious book mm. or it's a, a book. Or a textbook. A textbook. Mm. Yeah. Never a leisure book. Not a leisure book. And, so, and then, so then the job of the South African Book Development Council okay. started, then they, you know, based they started National Book Week based on these stats. They started National Book Week as a campaign that is going to encourage South Africans to actually to become active readers of books. So in National Book Week started uh, in about in 2010. And so this year we were celebrating its seventh year running. Wow. Um, yes. So it's, and it's actually what it has grown. What are the activities around that? Yeah, it has grown because mm -hmm. when we first started, it was just, for, you know, it was just in Gauteng. In okay. Johan, you know, we had some activities at um, 
not market the museum africa okay. in newtown oh, so yes, the I'm activities that take place there uh you know there's, there are book reading sessions there's um um uh, po there's poetry there's um there's um the spoken word there is geez there's a yeah there's a lot there's of activities a lot of things there are authors on. there are conversations with authors mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um you know who come and talk and talk about you know, like their books and then there are people from, also from the publishing industry that talk because not if we find that not a whole lot of people actually know the publishing industry very well and, and what is going on mm -hmm. you know, like in the book publishing industry mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you know the, there are sessions and workshops that i held to actually encourage um, you know to inform people about the book publishing industry which is great th because then you not only dealing with trying to get people to read more but you're helping people that have that writing ability and that passion in them to yes. know how they can go about making a professional career of it so guys uh, if you thought maybe reading books is getting out of fashion and really doesn't get with your style well Vista things differently. Get the book, get reading, and get to know how you can extend your imagination, extend your vocabulary. Interestingly enough, is you're a well-traveled and well-studied person yourself. I see you did a whole lot of studying overseas. Yes, yes, I have. Um, I did my undergrad in, um, in the United States for about four years, and that was um, undergrad studies in, jeez, uh, I did quite a lot. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. So I, It's interesting, what I really found interesting is that you've got a BA in orchestral music. Classical music, yeah. Yeah, classical yes. orchestral music. So I, yes, in those four years, I did actually a double major. Uh, it was in uh, classical music, as well as in uh, mass communication slash journalism and a minor degree in English. <laughs> so has the classical music element, do you think that space and that skill helps in any way with your um, management and journalism? Yes, because, you know, there's a great deal of discipline in classical music. I know. You know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very formalized um, industry. So you, 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 there's a whole lot of things that people can actually take from it. Uh, you know, discipline being the first one, yep. and order being the second, because you have to be able to organize your life. You have to, to be able to actually know the order of things, um, so that you can structure your life accordingly and your job and what you, and what it is, whatever it is that you do that you're interested in. You've got to have those things, um, you know, around you. Otherwise, you're just gonna be messy. Mm. You know, it's just going to be messy for you. So you classical. Yes, I've learned quite a great deal from uh, from my classical music studies, how to speak better. And you know, like I've learned languages, you know, because we had to because if you're going to be singing in French and German and Italian, you've got to know what you're saying. Yep. So I had to, you know, like I had to take those classes. Again, there's um, a great deal of formalized um, methods there that you like that you that you pick up. Languages help a great deal, actually. On point communications, mm -hmm. that's what that's what you're busy with. That's what you do. Yes, yes. Um, at on point PR, like I said, that is you know that is exactly what we do. We tell the stories of the brands that we work with. We give people information. We let people know what it is that our clients are doing. So. If there is a company, we were talking about National Book Week just earlier. Yes. Um, you know, like National Book Week Very is a client. Very interesting, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Um, National Book Week is a client of ours, but we are making sure that people do know that National Book Week is happening. At a, you know, in all, it's always in September, the first week in September. So it's going to run from this date to that date. We always tell people that you know, this is what's going to be happening around which time. If David Lale has a show, it is our job to put the, that information out there. David Dale is going to be hold, you know, showing his latest collections, and this is where it's going to be taking place. Um, you know, here's what you need to know about the, about his work and about his collections. Um, Simpua Dana, same thing. You know, she's doing a great. She's just did a symphonic experience mm -hmm. this past weekend. That was it great. Was I was saw a couple of things on social media about that. See? <laughs> <laughs> Without us, people wouldn't be knowing yeah, about such things. Yeah, so that's yeah. the, you know that's the job of. Um, your, your PRs, I mean, it goes, obviously, it goes way beyond that, but that's part of what it is that we do. We just let people know information that uh, our clients want you to know. Okay, would, would, say, would you say you're more talent-based or corporate-based in the services that On Point offers? Well, we... In terms are, of clientele? Yeah, our, our offering is actually quite broad, but yes, in terms of clientele, we are mostly 
um, or you know, like on corporate brands. Okay. And few on the on, on the personalities. One interesting thought that I've had around that is that uh, doing the PR for corporate band, uh, brands, rather, are you communicating the message of the brand to the consumers at the same time trying to prepare the consumers to meet the corporate demand in terms of skill? It's a, yeah, it's a bit of both, um, but mostly it is about communicating the messages you know, you know, that the corporate brand um, wants the public to know. Mm. So we ensure NetBank, for example, um, you know, being one of our clients. So when the NetBank Cup comes around, mm. we need to let people know um, mm. this is what's going on around the NetBank Cup. This is who's going to be playing. Excuse me. Um, these are some of the activities taking place. Uh, we've actually, you know, infused the lifestyle element into the net, um, the net bank cup oh, itself. Wow. You know. wow! Wow! Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you what's know, just the, to what's the lifestyle <laughs> element that you guys put in there? Well, in about 2014, mm -hmm. uh, we introduced what was called the football fan fashion. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it was about uh, showing and, ex you know, because, you know, s fans, we call them super fans, uh, you know, fans uh, at a stadium, they're always so expressive in, you know, in showing their support for the teams that for they the love. Teams and the so, players, you know, they yeah. actually, you know, they Those dress themselves up. Cry as well, eh? They cry as well. They cry. You know, they, you know, they create costumes, you know, they put in a lot of work into how they're going to look. Oh, so, the so we were inspired by the fashion that's coming from the fans because, you know, they put in a lot of work. So we said, actually, why don't we take these guys? Because it was also a matter of giving them a voice as well. Yeah, true. Because if you, in like in football sense, people forget that actually fans are very important mm -hmm. in like for for the for the teams that they support. Mm -hmm. So we started. We said, actually, let's take. Why don't we take these fans, match them up with um, established designers, and see what they could they could create wow. together. So we did that, and we came up with the football fan fashion, and we held a show. You know, we had part. We when we first started, we started only with a few uh, with. Uh, three designers and three super fans. So, you know, David Lale had a team, you know, had, had super fan from Kaiser Chiefs that he was working with. Uh, Baba Alfred Baloy, I'm sure you guys know him with the Makaraba <laughs> yeah, head. Everybody, everybody knows, knows him. him. <laughs> yes, those kinds of guys. And, you know, one from Pirates and then one from Sundowns. And we just matched them up with established designers, which were Craig Jacobs, David Lale, and Anisa Mbungwe of Loin Cloth and Ashes. They came up with great creations. We had a fashion show the night before the NetBank Cup. It, you know, it was all part of that experience. We took media to Durban because the final was held in Durban. In Durban, yes. Yeah. So we took media there. You know, we created a whole lifestyle experience, which culminated in that fashion show in the evening. Mm -hmm. And then they enjoyed the game. The game. And, you know, we hosted them in the suites. It, it was really an incredible that is, moment. That, it sounds incredible. Yeah. It sounds mm -hmm. like a whole experience you know, yeah. in the lifestyle. Yes. So those are the kinds of things that we do because then it also changes the perception that people have of you know a particular bank or a particular brand sorry mm -hmm. so now obviously in this case you know it was net, it was net bank so, so we how sort people of carry view. that principle across to every client that you have on them exactly point. so you know it changes the perceptions that people have of it uh, so now they start because you start associating the activities with who the brand is and then you people start thinking of net bank as you know Maybe they're not so bad after all. They're they're a cool bank, you know. They do I such things. I should bank with them. Yeah, you see yeah, what I mean. So yeah. you see a lot of you know things that uh, that you know that we are doing that are more in tune with what's happening in the world right now from a lifestyle point of view. Pretty pretty mm. interesting co concept indeed. Um, in closing, uh, the industry that you're in, um, where do you think that it is going? You know, in your professional. Uh, experience where mm. do you think that it's going and how do you think people who want to get involved in it can associate themselves and not miss the gravy train <laughs> <laughs> well the you know the pr industry is not going anywhere it can only <laughs> it can only grow from here on i really didn't expect <laughs> that <from> you. <laughs> you know it can only grow from here on as long as there are brands out there that need to communicate messages to the consumers, to their publics, you will always have a PR person. As long as there are celebrities misbehaving out there, they will always need PR people to actually help them shape uh, the message that they want to communicate. They will want people out there, such as PR practitioners, who will help them um, you know, clean up their image. They will always need PR people to help them put out fires. <laughs> <laughs> put out fires too. <laughs> we put out a lot of fires. Um, and so to, you know, for young people that are wanting to get into the industry, 
uh, one, you know, the couple of things obviously I, w- I would push. Um, cause now I find that with the, you know, with the younger crop, mm, there's mm, always, mm. you know, there's uh, always a rush wow. wanting to cause what they see, mm. you know, is obviously these events that we do, mm. but they think, you know, they come with the understanding or thinking that that is the life that we lead every day. <laughs> it's not glamorous. Mm. It's not always glamorous. Mm. There's a great deal of work that goes, um, you know, that goes behind the scenes mm. and it's, serious work that you need to do to put together that beautiful event that uh, they, you know that would have, they would have been exposed to, to yeah. but so what i'm encouraging them to do is to go to school finish the course get a leisure <coughs> book get a leisure <laughs> book read 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 it is very important even uh, you know, like a person like myself that you know that is already established themselves within the industry yes. it is still important to actually read mm. and continue learning more and more and more about the industry that you're in because you need to always sharpen your axe otherwise if you don't it's gonna go blunt and then you're not gonna be able to cut any wood wow so always sharpen that axe Profound. and hone your skills great stuff now you had it first or you heard it rather first right here on thought leaders and we're sitting with vista saying you know get a leisure book because it can probably take you to places where you never ever thought you'd find yourself thought leaders right back tv this is thought leaders on right back tv right back tv now on youtube subscribe now